podcast archive section of our website, which you can reach via our homepage at www.lightwaveonline.com. If you'd like, you'd also be able to download a copy of today's slides via the event resources tab. You should see on this, your screens right below the Ask a Question box. Just quick, click the tab to reveal the slide files. Finally, if you want a certificate of attendance, perhaps for continuing education purposes, we can also provide that to you if, if, if you would like one. And with that, uh, let's begin our look at constructing fiber networks, the value of solutions. Um, Josh, the floor is yours. All right. You can just verify that the uh, slide is showing correctly. <clears throat> you are good. All right, great. Thank you, and, and good morning, everybody. I'm here to talk about constructing fiber networks the value of solutions. So the purpose of my discussion today is to describe how a solutions-based approach to fiber hardware can improve the total return on investment of a fiber network by improving logistics, improving labor utilization, improving space utilization, which potentially can help with permitting, improving installation practices and reducing lifetime issues, and improving revenue by speeding time to market. So let's get into each of those bullet points and talk about how a solutions-based approach helps. First, logistics. So this is about getting people, materials, and tools to the job site. And there's a couple of aspects to this, getting things from a manufacturer location to some kind of storage area, you know, a warehouse owned by a service provider or a contractor, a distributor warehouse, something like that. So it's some kind of intermediate step before the products then go to the job site. And some key considerations here are how many vehicles, how many trips, how much weight and bulk. And this affects service providers and network constructors in two ways. So first of all, there's the shipping cost. It's usually almost always a commercial shipping company that gets paid to take things from the manufacturer to a warehouse. Um, and either way, you know, the purchaser ends up paying for that cost, you know, even if the manufacturer in some cases pays the commercial shipping company directly, that ends up being accounted for in, in the price that you pay one way or another. And then usually a contractor or if a service provider has their own crews doing an installation, they bear the expense of purchasing the trucks, purchasing the fuel, paying the drivers and all of that to get all that to a job site. So this is a significant amount of expense and for those who have sustainability goals as well, there's a significant sustainability aspect to not only operating, but also uh, building and purchasing all of these trucks. So how can a solution-based approach help? It can help by making that package of items that needs to be brought to a job site more compact and efficient. So making items collapsible is an example of doing that. The vault shown here in that middle sketch is collapsible and that allows more of them to fit on a given truck, which allows more efficient use of the trucks. And again, this affects both the process of getting them from the manufacturer to the customer and the, pro and the process of the customer distributing these to work sites. So, Fewer truck rolls can result in a need for fewer trucks, definitely results in less fuel consumption and less need to pay drivers. Compact and lighter cables are another example that goes right along with that. More cable per reel, more cable per kilogram or pound, fewer reels to ship, more cable per trip because you can get more cable on a reel with a more compact cable. So a solutions-based approach that makes logistics and space utilization a common theme 
allows for more savings and a better ability to deliver a package of items to a site. So you're more likely to get the cable you need, the vault you need, the closures you, you need, all that other stuff in a package to a job site with fewer truck rolls. A second way that a solutions-based approach helps is by improving labor utilization. So this is a key consideration here. Labor supply is going to be a critical limiting factor for network construction over the next few years. Uh, this, there still are major projects by large telecoms, especially, to build out their fiber networks. Uh, AT&T, Frontier, and many others have big projects that are still ongoing. So that's consuming a lot of the supply of technicians, both in terms of their own employees and contractors. We have significant amount of private funding going to smaller providers as well, and an immense amount of public funding, in fact, an unprecedented amount. So labor supply is going to be a critical limiting factor. And we've, industry-wide, we've acknowledged this for a while. There's programs to help address that. It's unclear if those are gonna be able to provide the labor supply needed. So given those constraints, projects, however, can't wait. People are expecting more bandwidth within the company. Uh, you know, senior management is expecting to build these out. The need for revenue and profitability is driving the, the need to upgrade these networks to, uh, to deal with competition and offer better service to customers. And additionally, government-backed projects in particular may have strict deadlines. BEAD Act, for example, does have deadlines for network construction. So if those are not built by a certain time, there's the potential for adverse consequences. So making the most efficient use of skilled labor will be critical to meet build schedules. How can a solutions-based approach help? Well, a few ways it can do it are through plug and play, technologies and products and through things that help record data about networks in a more straightforward and easy to manage way. So for example, a solutions-based approach can reduce the demand on a limited supply of splice technicians by using hardened connector solutions, including terminals, drops, and hardened cables. So, Hardened connectors, by definition, have to be a, a solution. You need drop cables to plug into terminals, and those drop cables and terminals have to work together. So there has to be, and then there has to be integrated cable. So you can not only make the connection, but also run the signal from one place to another. So pretty much by definition, those have to be solutions. These solutions can also help provide a demarcation between working groups like passing a home versus connecting. Those are almost always done at different times, those two activities, and usually done by different groups of people, even if they're the same service provider using their own internal staff. Usually it's two different working groups, even if it's the same contractor managing Homes Connect and ongoing maintenance of a network, as well as construction, they often have different people doing those tasks. So having a clear demarcation is critical and a solutions-based approach takes that into consideration and has that, whether it's at a terminal, whether it's a, the uh, point of entry into a home, uh, those are both examples of how a solution-based approach addresses that. A solution-based approach can also reduce the time spent on data record keeping. So having good data about the network, where things are, how they got tested, is critical for many reasons. It's critical for both for handoff between internal work groups. If you're using a contractor, it can be critical for a contractor to demonstrate and record that 
yes, we did install that, we tested it, it works, and provide that information to the network operator who is managing their contract. So all of that is critical, but it can be time consuming. A solutions-based approach can reduce that time by using cloud and Bluetooth enabled test and inspection equipment linked to user-friendly software. So having that kind of software integrated with the hardware so you're doing more than, than just uh, recording data, printing it out, or, some, or doing some kind of manual electronic process to transfer it. Instead, it directly uploads to a cloud program and makes that process much easier. And then you have good data and you're making more efficient use of your laborer's time because the recording and transmission of that data is more automated. Improving space utilization is another key consideration and a way that a solutions-based approach can help. Some of the positive impacts of better space utilization is you're more likely to fit into existing infrastructure. We'll talk more about what that means later. Reduced installation time, for example, less digging if you're digging out a smaller area, easier to handle something in an aerial application, which helps speed the work process, and a potential to reduce permitting and make ready costs. Again, it's not a direct impact, but it is an indirect impact, and we'll describe and we'll talk about how that impact is realized. A solutions-based approach is about making things smaller and by making them smaller, providing options. So compact ribbon and microcourse stranded cables are more likely to fit in existing conduits, uh, which reduces work and permitting when that's possible, and they work well with newer microduct systems. So a approach that not only provides a smaller cable, but takes into consideration the types and sizes of microducts it might work with, this is typically a step function. So there isn't an infinite range of sizes for microducts, there are certain sizes. And with a step function, and similarly with existing infrastructure, there is a step function that whatever duct or conduit is out there has a certain size. And taking that into consideration, you can fit a cable in there that maximizes the capacity that you can get through that existing infrastructure. And when you do that, of course, then you don't have to do the directional boring, the inst installation of a new conduit. There's less hassle of permitting because you're doing less work with big noisy machinery, uh, less need to mark other utilities and try to avoid them. And, and again, whether you're a network operator who's looking at reducing the uh, the price your contractor is going to charge you, or if you're a contractor making a purchase decision and considering how much your costs are going to be, that can make a huge impact. Also, solutions consisting of more compact and therefore more flexible cables with collapsible fiber ribbons, uh, smaller splice closures and vaults can reduce the volume, reduce the amount of digging, and provide more location options to deal with permitting. So for example, what was shown to the right is a combination of all of those items that provides splicing for two 864 fiber cables in a vault 44 by 34 by 26 with room to spare. So there's room in the future to come in, say with a 144 fiber lateral cable uh, and attach those in. And then this volume reduction also applies for different cable counts. If it's two 432s or two 288s, et cetera, uh, the volume is reduced regardless of, of that. So older solutions, in this example of two 864 fiber cables, they required a 60 by 30 by 30 inch at a minimum. And in many cases, we saw people using 60 by 30 by 36. So 
that provides a nearly 30% volume reduction. And if you were going to use a 36 inch depth, then the volume reduction is even greater. So what does that do for you? Again, less digging, less cost to install, but it also gives you some more placement options. So if you're doing an underground installation and you have to place a vault, you've got to find a place to do that. And especially in more urban areas, that can be a challenge. You're placing it under a sidewalk or something like that. You've got to consider the other utilities that are in the area. So again, smaller volume means you have more options for where you can fit it. You're more likely able to put it where you want it as opposed to just where there is space available. And also, and again, it can help with permitting, again, by providing more options if it's not, if the permitting agency doesn't want it in one space, you're more likely to be able to fit it into a smaller window somewhere else. So again, not a direct one. It doesn't help with all of the red tape around the permitting process, but again, gives you some more options that you didn't have if you didn't take a solutions-based uh, approach. Improving installation and reducing lifetime issues. So this is another huge impact on both time and cost. Most lifetime problems with a fiber network happen for one of two reasons. One is external factors. Somebody digs up a cable somebody snags an aerial cable, a weather event comes and knocks poles down. Well, in each of those cases, there's not much a fiber and fiber connectivity manufacturer can do to avoid those. But in the second category, those are installation faults which are not discovered until some kind of event happens. Examples of that might be improperly installed hardware allows water and ice intrusion, so you don't a fiber closure correctly uh, and water gets in and either the water itself does the damage or in more northern places it freezes and then ruptures the splice closure and impinges on or even breaks fibers. Another example might be fibers bent too tightly or broken which might not be discovered until a customer subscribes and you try to light up a dark fiber and then discover oh it wasn't routed properly in the splice closure and one of these fibers um, was, bent too, was bent too much, deteriorated over time, or is actually broken, some, something along those lines. And again, those are just examples. There are many others where an installation fault might not be noticed, again, even with, you know, even with requirements for testing process, for testing and record keeping, it might not be identified until, again, you try to light up a dark fiber, customer subscribes, et cetera. So how can a solutions-based fix address these? Well, one way that vendors are doing this is by AI integration. The vendors are beginning to use artificial intelligence to guide technicians in the field during installation and troubleshooting. So the AI is trained on the vendor's solutions to identify potential faults providing frontline users with instant self-audit and needed corrective actions to fix issues in real time. So this avoids costly and time-consuming rework. Again, whether that rework happens as part of the construction process, because you come along and test something during construction, identify a problem and have to rework, or whether it's identified later, either way, it's costly to go back out to a work site, roll a truck, have, tech, have technicians, Again, these skilled laborers spend time driving rather than working, um, then that can significantly reduce cost as well as speed the process of network construction. In-field data collection also is another aspect of these kind of AI-based tools that can help management drive continuous improvement and quality control. So you can see, for example, if there's a consistent issue with uh, in working with a, something in practice and go back and address that with training or whatever other uh, corrective action makes sense. Uh, ongoing updates to the AI allow for easy deployment of new work practices and reduction of bad habits. 
And the reason this is a solutions-based approach, of course, the AI is looking at these things in detail and has to be able to recognize a given manufacturer's product, a given splice tray layout to really do the best job. So when vendors work together with software providers or have their own uh, software development, they can really add a lot of value by doing this. Again, not just reducing cost of installation, but also reducing problems down the road. And finally, the total effect of all these solution benefits really is about speeding time to market. There are other benefits such as sustainability benefits for the compactness and uh, and reducing lifetime issues. But a big part of what I've been talking about is ultimately results in a faster time to market. So that by better logistical flow, easier to get items on site on time, better labor utilization leads to faster completion of construction, better use of space also leads to faster completion and potentially can lead to an easier permitting process and better installation process practices mean less rework again especially that process of returning to the job site so the question is can we put a dollar amount on that what is it worth in terms of money well the answer is it's worth a lot now i can't tell you in every single case it's going to be worth X amount, but this can be pretty significant. So I just took an example of a 10,000 home uh, fiber to the home build that's planned over a 12 month period. Other assumptions below. So for example, I figured on a three month prep time before that 12 month construction period starts. Um, and then you know, I assumed a certain take rate, a certain amount of time to reach that take rate, and a certain amount of ARPU per home, and a certain gross margin on that, on that revenue. And finally, a, a certain assumption on the annual cost of capital. So all those assumptions can change, but the bottom line is this is, a, this is an example just to show what kind of impact it can have. So in this example, with these assumptions, taking one more month on construction, so taking 13 months to build out those 10,000 homes instead of 12, costs about 130,000 in lost revenue. And that's a, that's a present value, so that's discounted to the present, but it's a little more if you just add it up over those five years. One month delay in starting construction costs nearly twice as much in this example. So you can see that is a pretty substantial impact from just making one month or about an 8%, in this example, about an 8% difference in how long construction takes. And again, change some of these assumptions, it can become even, even more significant. Higher ARPU per home, higher expected take rate, things like, things like that, larger project, obviously. But again, you know, pretty significant amount um, per home and uh, for this project in total. My conclusion is look for solutions. Look for a solutions-based approach to fiber hardware to improve your total return on investment when you're building these networks. So look at how your solution can improve logistics. Look at how it improves the labor utilization. So again, not just the cost of labor, not just the time that is spent doing a particular activity like splicing two 864 fiber cables together in a splice closure, installing a terminal, but also how that solution impacts things like rework and trips to the job site. Look at how it improves space utilization. Again, making a, a change in the size of a vault has some impact in reducing just the cost of digging it out, but it can have 
the space utilization can have a much bigger impact in areas where, again, it allows you to put a vault where you want it rather than where there's room for it. And especially if a more compact solution, such as a combination of smaller cable and splice closure, allows you to use existing infrastructure like existing ducts, existing vaults, that, when, it po when it's possible, has enormous savings. Look at how the solution can improve your installation practices and reduce your lifetime issues by addressing installation, making it easier, and allowing you to verify correct installation right away. And finally, think about how all this not only addresses your costs and helps you meet deadlines, but how meeting those deadlines can improve your revenue by speeding your time to market. So thank you for your time, and I will now take questions. Great, thanks, Josh. So <clears throat> some really great uh, concepts here, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some questions, and I think I may have some questions too. But um, uh, one here that I want to jump on that I, I think is interesting because everybody's talking about AI, <laughs> so maybe we'll start with that. Are there any specific vendor or solution details available for the AI solution that you're talking about? I, I think what they're asking is, is, is that something that uh, AFL is offering today? And it, I would assume that you guys, you know, AFL being such a, a large uh, supplier obviously works with different partners, but I, I, you know, I'd be curious to hear a little bit, a little bit, a little bit about that and, you know, uh, how the, uh, you know, how, how that's being approached for, from AFL, because that sounds like that could be a pretty compelling tool for a lot of people that are building out fiber networks. Yeah. Absolutely. We are uh, working, in this case, uh, I can I can actually name them. We're working with a company known as Skills Based on an AI oh. tool, and, uh, and it's in trials right, right now, and we expect that uh, it will be more broadly available in the near future. So... Definitely, uh, definitely making this available. Uh, and again, trials are very successful now. And uh, in fact, we have used it with a no in a number of projects, and it's working out very well. So, yeah, it seems like a really interesting uh, platform. Um, here's another one. Uh, do you feel that by having a volume reduction, it will allow larger fiber counts to be pushed deeper into the network? Yes, that is a huge, uh, in fact, that is a huge area of focus for us. Um, the question of how large a fiber count should you push into your network, how deep should you push it, what the value is of adding additional fiber in, even if it's initially going to be dark, that, you know, that's a topic we can fill an entire one-hour <laughs> webinar on by itself. Right. Uh, but just to summarize some of the benefits you know at the end of the day we construct these networks and this isn't like active equipment where you know like a home computer or data center servers and other and switches and things like that where we expect we're going to replace it every three years or so when it's when the uh, capacity and demand doubles or quadruples we build these, you know, the original telecom networks were in place in some cases for over 100 years before they got upgraded. And certainly we build these fiber networks and sort of the figure we toss around, some of the uh, testing standards are built around it is 25 years, but truth be known, that's really a minimum in terms of the, how long a fiber is gonna last in the field. We, Fiber networks that were built 40 years ago are still operating very well today and are able to handle the increased um, data, you know, the increased data rates per fiber. So when we determine our fiber counts, we can't just think about, well, what's in demand today? What demand do we anticipate for the next three years? It's, we have to think about what demand do we anticipate for the next 50 years? And while data rates per fiber will increase, we also know that the number of devices connected to the network, whether those are wireless nodes or a direct connection to some kind of computing device or data generating device, sensors or whatever, um, there's going to be more things connected into the network that will require physical connections. So at the end of the day, 
there's no substitute for having a fiber available. So I really strongly urge people to con consider how much extra fiber they need, and then that further emphasizes the value of those solutions that reduce the, the volume you need to uh, install and work with a given fiber count. Okay. Uh, speaking of fiber counts, um, another question here is, what are your thoughts on smaller cable and air-assisted installation over traditional pulling methods of fiber based on jetting through manholes, possibly alleviating additional splice faults? Certainly. Um, that's another example of the value of some of these compact solutions. Uh, so in terms of air blown installation versus traditional pulling, I mean, certainly there's, there's times where you want to use both, right? And the NAFL products support both, and many vendors have uh, solutions for both, such as those microcore stranded cables. Uh, you know, we offer a... Uh, we offer both ribbon and stranded for both applications. So in long, in long distances especially, these more compact solutions, you have a more compact cable, you can fit more on a reel. It allows you to go a greater distance between splice points, uh, between vaults, and save money that way. So going, for example, 10 kilometers instead of six reduces the amount of splicing reduces the amount of vaults you have to dig or the amount of uh, aerial closures you need to put in. So definitely those more compact solutions that I, that I talked about, reducing volume, uh, have an impact on there, both in uh, more local as well as longer haul networks. Good. Um, here's another question about the AI uh, stuff and, and just, I guess, kind of, you know, what you talked about, like those three steps recording. Uh, it, it asks, will the customer or the contractor have control over AI updates, audit, in-field data collection? I mean, certainly there's a lot of privacy, you know, you know, of course, competitors, will, <laughs> some large provider doesn't want a competitor getting access to that information. I guess I think that's what they're trying to see if you know how, how they can get access to this data that gets recorded yeah absolutely and that's why approaching this as a solution is so critical this can't be just an ad hoc oh we attached an app to that works with this product it has to be integrated with not only the app understanding what the product is and being able to recognize problems with the product but also integrated with the customer's needs for data recording, data access, data privacy, et cetera. So fundamentally, the idea that, all right, we've got, we're using an app and we have our proprietary data of well, where we've put stuff, what our fiber counts are, you name it. Um, there are plenty of cloud-based apps that, uh, that offer that and plenty of uh, cloud providers who specialize in doing that. Again, offering software services that keep your data private. So just, mm -hmm. I mean, think of Office 365, right? You're using right. a cloud-based software package and clearly your data that you create there is not becoming accessible to other entities. Right. And, and there are examples where you use data and Sort of the vendor you're using has access to an anonymized data to try to improve their own software, for example. So in this case, it would be you would see, you would get a chance to see what kind of problems are occurring frequently with your products. We, for example, as a vendor, would have the ability to see what kind of problems are occurring commonly with our product in the field without seeing company X installed this fiber count and put, um, you know, and put a splice closure here, mm. seeing individual employees' names, all that, all that kind of stuff. Mm. As for the, as for how we can configure it for the customer's use, you know, all these, all these different types of functions, such as the ability to track uh, 
work progress and monitor how employees are installing that. Those can be, you know, customers can use those or not use those. So if you're concerned that I really don't want to use this in such a way that I can say, hey, Jim, you, you are screwing up a bunch of these splice closures. I really don't want to have that over people's heads. You can, uh, you can configure it so that it doesn't do that. But again, the bottom line is what the vendor needs to do is, again, if the vendor is developing this software internally, they need to take all these considerations into account and develop the software. If we're working with a partner, we need to make sure it is a partner with experience and expertise doing these kinds of things, working with cloud solutions, and that understands not just good practices in terms of data management, but also different laws and regulations. Hmm. A vendor based in one country might not understand the regulations in another. Right. Obviously, with AFL, we've made sure that our vendor has that type of experience and understands <clears throat> and understands how to correctly manage that type of data. So it's a great question, very, very long answer, but the short, the short version of the answer is good software practices address that concern. So make sure you're looking for a vendor who has good software practices. Right now, AFL could could assist somebody if, like, you're an installer going into another country. I mean, you can, you know, I I, I guess there's different, like you said, different regulations. You can help navigate some of that, I suppose, and yeah, or package. Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to come back to the space issues. I know we hear a lot about that. You know, uh, again, as as people try to uh, blow more fiber and especially into kind of more of the busy you know, uh, larger urban kind of centers. I mean, I, I mean, is, you know, like how much is, is, the, is that really what this is helping to do, to attack is, is, you know, kind of these, these more crowded areas that could also have relevance in sort of uh, rural areas too. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, how, you know, yeah, I'm just curious about that because certainly that, that, that could be a big challenge if you're going into a big city where there's, there's so much infrastructure everywhere and how do you, you know, how do you get the permits and everything? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, a lot of the volume considerations are more critical when you're talking about an underground installation. And certainly as you go into rural areas, underground installations are less common, much higher proportion of aerial. But volume is very closely related to weight. I mean, there's only so much you can do with the density per unit of volume of a given fiber cable. I mean, the optical fiber weighs what it does, and that's usually the biggest component. And there's only so much you can do to be lightweight on the jacket and strength material and so on and so forth. So just as an example, volume is pretty closely related to weight. Hmm. Weight is important in an aerial installation. It makes things easier to handle when you're up in a bucket, when you're trying to string cables. It also has an impact on make ready costs pole attachments, things like that. So for, for example, the lighter the weight that you're putting on a pole, the more likely the pole is to be able to handle that weight. So fewer pole replacements. Again, this this is a step function, right? You're not gonna save a dollar fifty cents on every pole, but every once in a while you're going to encounter a pole that now you don't need to replace and you can save a significant amount of money and, and or time, again, depending on who ends up paying for pole replacement, by using a lower volume and therefore lower weight solution in an aerial deployment. Okay, um, just another more general question. I mean, the whole labor supply, I mean, that that's certainly an issue. I mean, you know, you, there's certainly people at the larger telcos that are, you know, maybe nearing retirement. I mean, it, you know, it's certainly, I, I do hear a lot about like, you know, the Fiber Broadband Association and the Communication Workers of America, a lot of different, there's a lot of different programs to attract the next generation, I guess, of uh, of new installers. But 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 what's your perspective on that? And, you know, how are there other solutions that, uh, you know, the providers can, you know, you talked about the solutions-based approach, but how do we get more people interested, I guess, in, in wanting to be fiber splices? Or is, is there, you know, there are programs that AFL has that, that can attract people to this industry? Or, you know, how, how do we kind of solve some of this? I mean, you know, cause that's going to be a big, big thing as you talked about. Yeah, certainly. So 
most of what vendor and manufacturers are focused on is training people on our specific products um, and assuming a certain level of knowledge coming in. So um, that said, uh, there are certain tasks like uh, like splicing and such where those are inextricably linked. You train someone on how to use a splicer, you're training them on splicing. On the other hand, you're not teaching them some of the other cable handling best practices. You get into that a bit when you're talking about splicing, but there's only so much uh, of that, that other topic you can address. That said, many organizations have recognized this. A lot of uh, vendors are partnering with various organizations to support that kind of introductory training before you get into the product specific training. Uh, you have organizations like the Fiber Broadband Association standing up, uh, standing up programs. You have various uh, states are working on programs for training. You know, the uh, but at the end, you're still going to have to look for hardware solutions that minimize or maximize the efficiency of your of the skilled labor supply because at the end of the day there are some dynamics in the broader economy that are still going to limit how many people uh, go into this so okay. overall workforce participation is down unemployment is very low so there's just less of a population of people looking for something different to do um, who can be attracted into this industry and all the training in the world won't be able to address that. So hmm. we're addressing part of it, but at the end of the day, I, I, I fear we're still going to face labor shortages, but that in turn increases the value of looking for a solution that helps address that. Right, like you just laid out. Um, 